Well, if you would, please find your way to Exodus 34. That's on page 74 of the Pew Bibles, if that would be helpful. And would you join me in prayer? Our great God, we've exalted your name among us by singing praises to you. You've revealed yourself so clearly in Scripture as a God who's faithful to his people. And we can only, out of gratitude, come here and worship you. We are so thankful to be saved. We are also thankful that you use your word even today through the preaching of the word to transform us as we behold the glory of Christ. Show us Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. Well, how can you be certain that things are okay with you and God? There are a lot of people in this world who are not very concerned with that question. And the reason why that is, is because they're either ignoring God or they have a misunderstanding of who he is. Because when we grasp our sinfulness in light of who God has revealed himself to be as the holy and just God, we have to start to question where are we at before this God? How can we stand before an infinitely holy God? And I will tell you this morning that Israel was facing the same exact question. After the sin of the golden calf, they are wondering, is everything okay with us and God? How can it be right? How can we make it right? We've sinned against God in a dreadful way. We saw them mourning last week when they heard the dreadful word that was spoken that God wasn't going with them. And we see God's response even more clearly in Exodus 34 today of how things can be repaired. God reassures his people by renewing the covenant that they had so quickly broken. And because this was a covenant relationship that God was in with his people, they broke it. He has no obligation whatsoever to forgive them. And so if he chooses to do so, it is a revelation of who he is within his own self. He does this not because anything compels him within the people of Israel itself, but out of his mere sovereign pleasure. And so we're going to learn much of who God is today as he reveals himself. And that big idea today is that forgiveness derives from what the Lord is in himself. And we're going to look at three aspects of the Lord's revelation that he gives to Moses here. The first is the Lord, he, that God is the Lord of law and grace. This is in verses 1 through 9. Second, the Lord of the Covenant in 10 through 28. And then we'll end with the Lord of Glory in 29 through 35. So let's begin. We'll read the text as we go. This is the first aspect of the revelation that God gives to Moses, that he is the Lord of law and grace. Read with me in verses 1 through 4. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write it on the tablets of the words that were on the first tablets which you broke, which you broke, emphasizing Moses broke the covenant. That was symbolic. Remember, he broke the tablets. That was symbolic of the fact that the people had broke the covenant. So God is not obligated to, to do this, but what does he do? He has him make two new tablets. Verse 2, be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. He gives these stipulations just like he did before. The covenant was broken. No one shall come up with you. Let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. This is all familiar to us. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. And he arose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone. By replacing the tablets, we get the feeling and sense that God is absolutely going to renew this covenant with his people. It's glorious. Now, the only thing that's different about this occasion, because we saw such familiarity, the mountain was set apart, God's holiness, nobody could come, Moses ascends. The only thing different now is in verse 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. This is the fulfillment of what we saw last week in Exodus 33, in response to Moses' request to see his glory. To see his glory. And here we have it. Remember, he gave those stipulations. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock and my goodness will pass by. Here we go. Now I want to give six things about this revelation as we walk through this together. 
The first two are by, by way of review. God is going to reveal himself first. This revelation is confirming. Why does God do this? Well, remember last time, Moses says, show me your ways, show me your glory. Why? He had already seen so much glory of God so far at the, Mos- uh, at the mountain with the, the, the glorious revelation of the thundering and the quaking. Why does he want more? It's an affirming sign that God will indeed go with his people. We've seen this back in Genesis 15 where God made promises to Abraham and then confirms it with the sign of the flaming fire pot going through the pieces. This is the same thing. So it's confirming. Second, the revelation is dangerous. I'll remind you what he said. You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. We have to hold that in in our mind. God's revealing himself to Moses, but this is dangerous to know who God is and see him in his glory. So, reminds me of Isaiah chapter 6, when we see those angels that have wings covering their faces. The imagery there is that they cannot look upon God. These are holy beings who cannot see the face of God. It reminds me of that Narnia series when Lucy finds out that Aslan is a lion. And what does she say? Is, you know, I was expecting a man. Is he safe? And the beaver says, who said anything about safe? Basically category error. Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king. And so the Lord stood before him in a cloud. This is this manifestation of the glory. It's not his full glory. It's still the cloud. It's veiling his essence. But notice third, this revelation is proclaimed. Listen to verse 6 and 7. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Proclaimed. The emphasis here is not on what Moses saw, but what he heard. That's what's so remarkable about this whole situation. Moses is asking to see God's glory, and yet he hears something. And that's the emphasis all throughout the Bible. The emphasis is upon what God says and speaks, his revelation of himself in his word. And we need to be thinking clearly about that. Fourth, the revelation is self-defined. And what do I mean by that? That means... He's going to reveal something about himself, but we have to caveat that a little bit. Because he says this. When he starts to talk about who he is, this sign of his glory, it says he proclaimed, and what does he say? The Lord, the Lord. And then he goes on to describe himself. And when we hear that term Lord, Yahweh, it immediately draws us back to what has been revealed about that name already in Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus 3... Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name, what shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That's the same name here, and so this is very important for us, particularly those people who like to study about God, love theology, love to know who God is, and so we start to start speaking about, yeah, we know God, we know know a few things about him, he's sovereign, he's good, he's just, which is all right and true, but the problem lies in when we think we have actually started to master God, and we start to bring him down to the extent that we're we're describing him just by words. But what he says here, when he proclaims himself, I'm going to reveal who I am, he says, the Lord, the Lord. I am what I am. So we have to always be thinking God is immensely greater and grander than we could ever even imagine when we even read Scripture itself. So we can't tame him. We can't reduce him. We can't master him. We always have to leave it open that he is more glorious than we ever even imagined. And so that's what's so striking when Jesus says in John chapter 8, takes this name upon himself before Abraham was, I am He's claiming more than pre-existence. He's claiming the self-definition that belongs to God alone. Fifth, this revelation is comforting. He goes on to explain what he means by who he is. The Lord passed before him, proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And if you are a sinner, you hear that and you say, praise God. To those in need, God is merciful, says, or compassionate, it could be translated. 
Isaiah 54, 7 through 8, where the Lord says, For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you. Just like Israel, we also need a compassionate God. And we see that most clearly in the Lord Jesus Christ, who looked upon the people as those who had sheep without a shepherd. It says he had compassion upon them. To those who cannot measure up, God is gracious, it says. He's merciful, but yes, he's gracious. This means undeserved favor. One professor put it this way. Sometimes students come to him. They don't have their assignment completed, and they say, would you give me some grace? And he said, no, you're not understanding it right. If, if you give, do half the work, and I just kind of accept that, that's not necessarily grace. Grace would be like if I did the assignment for you, and it was a complete perfect paper, and I gave it an A+. That's grace. It's not this sort of like do half and half. It's full, unbounding, measureless grace of God's favor given to sinful people. And that's good news for us. To those who are rebellious, God is slow to anger, it says. This is long-nosed. He's patient. He's waiting. He can forbear. We talk about this all the time in our family because we're so quick. We're like little self-righteous people. We want it all the way right now. Do it right. I can't believe this person did that. We need to forbear because God is long-suffering. To the unfaithful, God abounds in steadfast love and faithfulness. This speaks of the covenant nature of God's love. It's unchanging. We think, well, what about the covenant? Like, he cut Israel off and he was going to... They broke the covenant. God didn't. God's faithful to his word all the time. That means his promises are yes and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. He keeps steadfast love. It says for thousands, thousand generations it could actually be translated. This continues on Forever and forever, it can't be broken. It's important to notice that this doesn't mean that the thousand and one generation no longer receives God's steadfast love and faithfulness. This is just a term that the Bible uses often for thousands, means a, an infinite number. It continues on. He's gracious, merciful, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. To the guilty, God is forgiving, forgiving. Isn't that amazing? Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin? What? This is beautiful. This is what the word forgiving means. It's to lift or to carry. He removes our transgressions, our guilt, our sin from us and takes it away. Look at these three uses of the terms. Iniquity, that's turning aside from what is good and right. We have transgression here mentioned which is betraying the covenant with the king. You're going either beyond uh, what's commanded or not doing what you should. And then we have sin, any type of moral failure, breaking God's commandments. Every sin imaginable can be forgiven by this God. That's the emphasis. We love to see this in the Lord Jesus, too. We remember when the paralytic come? It was brought by his friends, and what does he say, son? Your sins are forgiven, and everybody's like, what? You cannot forgive sins, Jesus? And he says, yes, I can. He takes the prerogative of God, prerogative of God alone upon himself, and says, I can forgive sins. That's so good for us. Notice those six, the revelation is sobering. To the unrepentant, God is just. Verse 7, who will by no means clear the guilty... Okay, wait, he was forgiving, but he will by no means clear the guilty. How do we make sense of this? Well, it's those who reject God continually and are unrepentant, who aren't seeking God's compassion and forgiveness, justice will be done. John Owen writes, When God solemnly declared his nature by his name to the full, that we might know and fear him, he does it by an enumeration of those properties which we may convince us of that, that which may convince us of his compassionateness and forbearance, and not till the close of all makes any mention of his severity as that which he will not exercise towards any, but such as by whom his compassion is despised. So, if you don't want the mercy 
the grace, the compassionate faithfulness of God and his forgiveness, he will leave you in your sins. And he goes on to say, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, this could be interpreted a few ways. Some people say, okay, this means that the, you know, it's like generational sins so that the consequences of, say, like uh, either an abusive or a drunk father might also then spread to the son so that, you know, like he's kind of bound in that, and it's kind of like a natural consequence of that relationship. Is that what he's talking about here? Probably not. Uh, it also doesn't mean that the grandchildren are going to be punished for the sin of the parents, although it reads like that. But listen to Deuteronomy 24, 16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sin, which seems like God is going to hold responsible each individual for their particular sin. So what is he saying here? This speaks of God's determination to punish successive generations who commit the same sins as their parents. So that he cannot say, okay, uh, or he won't say at least, well, this child or this next generation who is committing these sins is only doing it because their parents have committed this sin, so I'm going to be lenient on them. He will say, no, my justice demands that I punish all iniquity. And then he states this, that it's for three to four generations, which is interesting why he uses that number. I read that this is the greatest numerical contrast in the Bible, three or four generations with thousands of generations. Well, what is that communicating? It's communicating something to the effect that God wants to be known of his steadfast love and faithfulness to his people forever. And so that's what he's desiring of his people, that they would keep his covenant and he would have this relationship with them forever and ever. It gets at the heart of God. And that's why Richard Sibbs said, if we would know the name of God and see God as he is pleased and delighted to discover himself to us, let us know him by who, those names that he proclaims there showing that the glory of the Lord in the gospel especially shines in mercy, which leads to us to think about the beauty of God's attributes in that he is merciful and gracious and also just, which culminates perfectly in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. For in Romans 3, it's said very clearly that God remains the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ Jesus. Why is that? Because Christ was put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. A propitiation means as, as an atoning sacrifice, as one that turns God's wrath away from the subjects to which he is then dying for. And those who trust in him have their penalty paid because of the blood of Christ. So that God can be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Christ. God is completely righteousness, is righteous. He doesn't sweep sin under the rug. He doesn't let it go. Instead, he has it perfectly satisfied, just as satisfied at the cross of Christ. So Moses is exuberant, he's excited, and he acts on this revelation immediately. Look at verse 8 and 9. Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth, and he worshipped. And he says this, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. Now, some people will grab this right here and say, all right, let's grab some principles for how we might pray to God. You worship first, and then here's, here's three ways you, you, your prayer should be sort of defined. You could do that, obviously, but I want to focus in on the fact that this is the mediator. It's a unique relationship that Moses has with God, and let's see what he says here in light of that. First, Moses does plead God's character. He takes what he just learned. You're, you're merciful and gracious, abounding in steadfast love. Forgive us of our all iniquity and pardon our transgressions, he says. He grabs a hold of what he knows to be true about God. Secondly, notice how the mediator identifies with the sin of his people. What does he say? Pardon our iniquity and our sin. Moses wasn't down doing the golden calf. You know that. He was up with God. So what is he doing? He's identifying with his people as being representative of them. And so 
paves the way for the, also the second mediator who would identify with the sins of his people, would take our sins upon himself. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, Moses attaches his plea for God to go into the presence of the people based on his favor that he has with God. That's also what God does in Christ when Christ pleads his obedience and favor with God. That then is then God treats us in light of that. So that's very key. The forgiveness of God's people and the promise of God to go with them is based not on the people at all, but on God and his character and the mediator. That's the gospel in a nutshell. And finally, this last request is almost beyond comprehension that he would even say this, but it's glorious. What does he say at the end there? Take us for your inheritance. Take us as your treasured possession. Immediately following, after pardoning our sin and iniquity, immediately following what we saw as a heinous disrespect for God's law, an idolatrous display of sensuality and awfulness, they say, Moses says, take us as your treasured possession, as your inheritance. Isn't that fascinating? To grasp this a little bit, you have to think of it in this way. Okay, a wife commits infidelity, comes to her husband and says, would you forgive me? And uh, the husband says, yes, of course, but she, sa- she goes further. No, I want you to love me in such a way that was even before this happened. In fact, make me the apple of your eye, the joy of your life, your infinite treasure possession in light of even after being unfaithful. That's what this is. Isn't this beautiful? That's us. We have to see that God has taken us. He says to Moses, I will. I will take you as my treasured possession, even though we know we're so sinful. That's wonderful and beautiful and uh, should push us forward in gratefulness to God to respond appropriately. Let's see. Secondly, he's the Lord of the covenant here in verses 10 through 11. Some assume that this is just put in here because it sounds a little bit disconnected, or this is a, a, a earlier part of the book that they bring right here. It's perfect, actually. And God says in verse 10, Behold, I am making a covenant. Before all your people I will do marvels, such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation, and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. This is it. I'm renewing the covenant with you. Everything's going to be as it was. I'm going to cast out your enemies. I'm going to do marvelous things greater than you've ever even seen. And we're saying, what could be any greater than God's demonstration of his power and authority in the plagues, in the provision of bread and manna and the rock? Uh, with, the, with the water, the demonstration on the mount, w- what could be greater? Well, God keeps his promise to a T because in the history of Israel, we see over and over, time and time again, of God doing miraculous and wonderful things through the people. Think of David and his destruction of armies. Think of the glory of the kingdom with Solomon. Uh, think then of how this was ultimately fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes on the scene healing raising the dead, lame, deaf, blind. All of it culminates in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ where we see the resurrection, the ascension, and then we're waiting until the coming again of Christ. That all will be fulfilled perfectly. You will see wonders from God's hand. Well, then he calls them like he did before when he makes a covenant with them to certain particulars. He calls them in verse 12 through 16 and warns them of the dangers of syncretism. Basically, turn from the world. Let's look at that together. Turn from the world. Take care, verse 12, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go. Lest it become a snare in your midst, you shall tear down their altars, break their pillars, cut down their ashram, for you shall worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. 
When they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons. And your daughters whore after their gods and make your sons whore after their gods. God's covenant relationship with his people demands that they take every single thing they do into consideration in light of what God has revealed about how they should live. Turn from the world. Do not bind yourself with unholy people. Make covenants with them. Do basically immerse yourself in the things of the culture. He says, be on guard. You are to be a distinct and separate people. That same message is for us today. We have to be thinking that because we're in covenant with God, that has bearing on who we marry, what we prioritize, what we say, what we watch, what we listen to, what we do, how we set up our weeks, how we set up our family structures. What, I mean, everything gets considered. Are we worldly? Are we just like the culture? Have we thought it through? We can't passively continue on just saying, you know what, I'll end up in the right place. We have to be intentionally saying, well, how would God have us live? Turn from the world, but then he also says, turn to God in acceptable worship. Verse 17. He goes through a smattering of commands that all have to do with worship. Verse 17, you should not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. Obviously, he needs to rewarn them of that, since that's exactly what they've done. 18, you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. 21, six days you shall work, and the seventh day you shall rest. There's this symmetry in this whole section. I won't read it all, but the, the truth that comes out is that you are called to trust God. Trust him. He's talking about annual pilgrim feasts, weekly Sabbath, false worship. What he's calling them is to strict adherence to the Old Testament worship laws that God is particular with how he should be worshipped, and you should trust him with that. And this comes out so strongly because he says keep the Sabbath day in, in harvest time, even in planting time. Those are the most important times of the year for actually harvesting and getting your stuff done and planting at the right time. He says, keep the feast during those times. Sabbath, make sure you're resting on those days, which implies you need to be able to trust me. Even with those feasts, they have to trust him with the land because those are pilgrimage feasts, which means they have to go to Jerusalem. All the males would go to Jerusalem. Well, if they go to Jerusalem, who is guarding the land? What are, isn't an army going to raise up and go and, and Take their lands. Look at verse 24 and 25. I will cast out nations before you in a larger borders. No one shall covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. I will protect you and bless you if you keep my commands, if you follow after me. If I am the center of your life, you have nothing to worry about. Translate that into the new covenant with us. God says not only to put off the world, but he says put on worship. Put on worship. Is your life centered upon the worship of God in our individual lives and what we do, do all to the glory of God, but then also in our private times, private, family, corporate gatherings for praise and honor of God according to how he has revealed he would like to be worshipped. Now in verses 27 through 28, we see some familiar language. The Lord said to Moses, write these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Moses has received God's law on these tablets. He's been up there 40 days, 40 nights. What does that remind you of? Well, the last time Moses was on the mount with God, 40 days, 40 nights, the people completely blew it. Is that going to be the same thing? Is that what he's going to come down the mountain to? Or has something of the mercy and compassion of God shown to this people changed their hearts? But that 40 day and 40 nights also reminds me of something important. Of course, the principle is uh, God determines how long someone can live or what they need to live. Um, there's some physicians in here. I, I'm not sure anybody can live for 40 days and 40 nights without food or water. I think that's probably been proven. So the principle is 
Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. But there was another person who did 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, yet was not communing with God, was going head to head with Satan. And what was he doing? He was doing that for us. He comes as the last Adam and in perfect obedience to where Israel failed in the wilderness. Adam failed in the garden with serpent's temp, uh, the serpent's temptation. Jesus obeys perfectly so that he could be the one to credit his righteousness to us. He fulfilled the law perfectly, always worshipped God perfectly so that he could credit that to us as well. Well, notice thirdly now the Lord of glory. He's the Lord of glory. Exodus 34, 29 through 35. Let's see this wonderful scene. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with them in Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses that the skin of Moses' face was shining. Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. The focus, the focus of this section, yes, is on Moses, but more importantly, it's on God's glory. Moses comes down from the mountain and he has something radiating from him. That would be a frightening scene, no doubt. Uh, but the emphasis is on the fact that he had been communing with God for 40 days and 40 nights, and somewhat of the glory of God had then so transformed him that he then radiated that to the people himself. No doubt this was God allowed this to happen so that he would be received as the mediator. I'm not sure it'd be easy to say, you know what, Moses, you're really not the spokesperson of God when he has these beams of light coming from his face. Of course, they ended up doing that multiple times, but that's God's intent behind it. But when they see his face beaming and they are frightened, it is meant to convey to us the glory and majesty of God that even when seen on a, a human being causes a certain amount of fear and angst, how much more the glory and splendor of God himself. But Moses' face Shining points to a greater reality that we see actually in Jesus himself. Recall the opening chapter of the Gospel of John. How does John speak of Jesus Christ? The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews picks up on the same thing when he says... Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus' divine glory was hidden beneath the veil of his human nature, but there were times when that would break forth and he would show who that actually was, who he is. And that comes out in the transfiguration on that mountain uh, where they ascended. Peter, James, and John saw Jesus' clothes became radiantly white, blinding white. And it says he was transfigured before them, transfixed. And guess who was there, which is fascinating? Moses and Elijah. Moses actually saw the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ in fulfillment of his petition, show me your glory. But notice what the emphasis of that passage is. The father said, this is my beloved son, Listen to him. Christ is the mediator of the new covenant who has the radiance of God's glory beaming from his own face, and we too must listen to him. But the shining face of Moses also points to something significant about our own lives in, as new covenant believers. And I don't have time to really unpack uh, this whole text, but I want, to, I want to read it with you because we want to see... Paul's commentary on our section in Exodus here that I think is fascinating. So 2 Corinthians 3, 
7 through 18, if you'd like to turn there, because it, it, it's a little bit of an extended reading, and I'll just be able to draw a few things from it. Let's read that together. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory had come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ it is taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, this passage gives quite a bit of insight into our text. I'll commend you to maybe read that this afternoon and study it, but we can at least mention a few things. Paul tells us that the reason why Moses had to wear a veil was that it would prevent the people from seeing the light emanating from his face eventually fading away. The glory that he had experienced came from the law and his ex the, the, the light had come from the experience of God, communing with him, the, the law itself. But it was not supposed to be the gl most glorious reality. It was to be fading away. Paul picks that up. The old covenant had its purpose and intention. It was culminating in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he calls it the ministry of condemnation. The law is good and holy and right, but when it comes to sinful people, it can only bring about death. You can't keep it. And so the law, glorious as it is because it reveals God's character, ultimately points to our sinfulness and leads to death. And so if you were to look at the law as a means to your righteousness, which the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in, Mo, in uh, Paul's day were doing, he says, a veil lies over your hearts and you're not seeing correctly. Because in Christ is where the glory is now and you must perceive in him your means of salvation. So Paul tells us that this ministry of righteousness, in contrast to the ministry of condemnation, which is the new covenant, not only provides a righteousness that's not our own, credited to us, but also transforms us as we behold the glory of Christ with unveiled face, we're transformed into his image from one glory to another. And then we start to even look like Moses with radiant light coming from our face, spiritually in one sense, because we reflect who Jesus Christ is, which this was all pointing to. So Exodus 34 a glorious passage that tells us that he is a forgiving, a merciful, a gracious God that stems from who he is in himself. There's nothing demanding that God treat his people with like this other than himself. You get what I'm saying? Nothing outside of himself. It's his character that propels him forward to show himself to be who he is, a God abounding in grace and mercy uh, and steadfast love to thousands, faithfulness. But as we know so well, because our Lord Jesus died on the cross, he will no way clear the guilty. If you have not come to Christ today, you are underneath this just God's wrath. But if you turn to the Lord, the veil is removed. 
You have Christ's righteousness credited to you, and you are being then sanctified until ultimately you will be glorified. And that's good news. Let's pray together. Our Lord God, we thank you for your word. Uh, it's vibrant. It, it has so many contours to it. One day we could be so uh, frightened by your holiness, by your justice, and we could be shaking in our boots. And then we come to you revealing yourself as compassionate and merciful and long-suffering. And we say, wow, you are so glorious. How could we ever, ever not worship you as you ought Forgive us, Lord, for our lackadaisical attitude, for our apathy, for the times we don't keep your covenant laws. You've called us to a standard of living that goes beyond even the articulated words of the commandments and gets at the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. And so we do see that the law condemns us and we're thankful for Christ's righteousness, but we also see that the law is our guide. So would you help us, would you help us to follow after you through your commandments? empowered by the Holy Spirit, motivated by the gospel so that our lives would be characterized by gratitude. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.